Well, boys, looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom? Holy fuck, is there a show in front of us today? God damn. My name is Eric, and uh, the man with the blasphemy over here is Michael Kester. That's me, yeah. Uh, we're going to spoil both Chillerama <laughs> and Super. Now, you know you can use chapters to skip those. Yeah. Um, Chillerama is an anthology film. features a, a couple directors we really like and a couple we haven't talked about before. And then Super is amazing. And if you listen to it, it will ruin it for you. Uh, you don't think you want to see Super. If you've, if you've already seen Super, you love it. You know it's amazing. Yeah. If you uh, haven't seen Super, you probably think it's not the type of thing you would be into. It is. Uh, it is extremely the type important thing, and amazing. And yeah, everybody needs to see it. So we always kind of urge people, hey, you should watch the movies. It'd be a good idea. Really, see Super or do not listen to that chunk of the show. I will hate you forever. Um, we'll start with Chillerama. Okay. So you brought me this. I did. Uh, I had read about this on the tweets. Yeah, Chillerama is one of those things that uh, it had been discussed, it had been talked about sure. in the WWW. Yeah, right. And uh, it just seemed like it wasn't a real thing. Well, no one really promoted it yeah. as if it well, was their if, film. If I were to pick <laughs> right. four directors, uh-huh. I mean, granted, they may not be these four, but these sure. would be four directors I would eventually choose. Yes. Um, well, back when we called for trick-or-treat horror sure. anthologies... This was uh, in in a very different way, but this was uh, basically what we were looking for. A, yeah, right? we wanted something from the the trick or treat canon. Sure, but uh, hey, we'll take four well talked about double feature yeah. type directors and yeah. put them together in a movie. So we have three that we've not we've talked about. We've seen their shit on the show. Great, and one that I keep trying to wedge onto the show, but because he worked on a sequel, it's really difficult. Yeah. Um. So we have Adam Rifkin. Adam Rifkin was Look in Detroit Rock City. Right. And then we have Tim Sullivan. Tim Sullivan was the uh, remake of 2000, I guess, reimagining of 2000 Maniacs, uh, 2001 Maniacs. Yes. And then our old buddy, Adam Green. Hatchets, Frozen. Hatchet 2. Spiral. Yeah. Everything. That's amazing. Uh, huge Adam Green fans, you and I. We would see this if it was three terrible directors and Adam Green. Can we say hypothetically two terrible directors and Quentin Tarantino and Robert Rodriguez? Yeah, that's about how that equation balances out. <laughs> um, then we have this fourth guy, Joe Lynch. Uh-huh. And uh, Joe Lynch worked on Wrong Turn 2. Damn it. Which is one of my favorite slash gore splatty splat movies. And it's the only one off the top of my head it's the only one of the stack of a million that i can eventually come up with that we've not managed to wedge onto the show yeah i know and it's mostly my fault i mean i'm gonna take the blame for that i feel uneasy about putting sequel things on the show somewhere in my head the stuff has to line up we'll just pair it with the second half of titanic uh... anyway so now we're getting joe lynch on the show which gives us more cause in the future to actually put a joe lynch movie on the show. Yeah. So Chillerama, I mean, it's, we already made the four rooms joke, but, but it's yeah, that's, pretty, it's pretty sure. similar to four rooms. For sure. Um, It's four short films directed by four different directors. And then they're all kind of part of a continuous story. I love four short films. Yeah, me I too. I love that. Absolutely. Adore. Two hours don't even feel it. So um, I think the best way to cover it is to talk about the four of them separately. And you don't think we should uh, start by giving our favorite Orson Welles jokes and mocking HD and video on demand? Yeah, you know, we could start there. Because that's how Richard really thinks we should. Uh... Uh, oh, by the way, Richard really. Oh, is that his name? That's that guy name okay <laughs> so richard's been uh in 10 movies yeah. on the this fucking show and he's been he's been whacker richard all over double he feature. has he has and we never get his name yeah we do, it's hard that guy from hatchet well, because he's never really top billed in chili willy from yeah. uh the man from earth exactly and he's great in all of this stuff and we always love him and we always go hey that guy that's cool but we can never find him in the billing because right. he's so low we just have no his picture wasn't on imdb so we did some extensive research today and we found out his name, even how to pronounce it, Richard wow. Really, which is yeah. apparently how he pronounces it. Yeah. So today he found our, our secretive uh, second tier double feature theme, which is things that came out with strange theater releases and using video on demand. Yeah. 
which was, uh, you know, Chillerama was not an easy thing to see in a theater unless you're near Quentin Tarantino's theater. Sure. Uh, otherwise, you head over to Video On Demand, streaming video. Yeah. But I have a feeling we'll come back to this reality. Maybe yeah. we should start with Wadzilla. All right. So Wadzilla is Adam Rifkin's joint. Awesome. It's uh, Adam Rifkin, you said, Detroit Rock City and Look. But he also did this movie. And so you see Detroit Rock City and you see Look. Mm -hmm. And then you see Wadzilla and you yeah. get a confusy face. Sure, definitely. Um, Adam Rifkin also worked on some of the really low-end National Lampoon stuff. Oh, yeah. He worked on this film called Stoned Age. Yeah, I think you mentioned that. I can't remember if I cut it for him out of embarrassment right. or not. I think I left it in. Which it's, I, I've seen it and it sucks, but it sucks so much. I mean, you watch it and it's terrible, sure. but you can see that it doesn't want to be terrible. Sure, It right. really wants to work. But something is just not, the gears just aren't grinding. So despite the uh, the faltering Stone Age, uh, you're fully behind this Adam Rifkin sure. thing. Well, if you because see... Because for a while, this was kind of, Adam Rifkin's doing some great movies. Yeah. I don't know how I feel about him. The thing about Stone Age is when you see Wadzilla, that's what he you wanted. Start to get it, yeah. Yeah. And you also see a lot of the cast from Stone Age reappear, which is oh, bizarre. Really? Less Gary Busey, but still. <laughs> great. So we brought Stone Age back up, but in a way that somehow... Um, Makes it all right again. Yeah. You know, I'm reminded every once in a while, we watch so many fucking movies for this show. I kind of forget these different genres of films I always mean to revisit. Uh, Hammer Horror is one yeah. that uh, when we get to uh, uh, Adam Green's yeah. uh, bit, it kind of makes me think about that. And we got to get some of that stuff on the show and we're working on it. But also that 50s sci-fi kind of monster thing that's totally separate from hammer horror right. it's not attack you know, of the 50 foot woman that's exactly it this is way attack of the 50 foot woman first of all it looks so fucking cool yeah it's uh that that type of grindhouse aging but for the 50s monster aesthetic right. well all the special effects are done by the chioto brothers who did killer clowns from outer space oh cool i had no um, idea yeah they're an incredible effects crew they're dubious directors we'll get killer clowns on the show okay um but with some hammer horror can we just yeah, say that not great done um so yeah the special effects it's weird because it can't be easy to do good special effects that look like they're shitty but not shitty special effects that look like they're shitty sure well the other part of making a movie like this is that people don't play around in this particular era very often right. in the throw in the kind of grindhouse inspired um planet terror death proof inspired throwback films so now we have an idea of what Attack of the 50-Foot Woman would look like in a modern-day HD, you know, streaming video on streaming. demand release. It's, uh, and it's gorgeous. It just, the, the type of, uh, I mean, it's a more subtle grain, but just the blown-out highlights and the pastels especially, you're just not used to seeing that. The, the type of um, effects that are used uh that you talked about back when we did the blob you right. were mentioning that projection you know those type of special effects when you really see them in high definition you can celebrate those in a way that right. you uh you can't quite in the the standard definition the um previously filmed stuff the authentic stuff from the 50s but i think the music's the best of all the kind of throwback elements it really makes me love monster films again yeah it uh it just has this over the top kind of sincerity to it. It's what you put in a film of this genre, and they all seem to have this stuff. It really makes me miss it. So when we watched this, um, you had seen it before, and I had not, and right. I, uh, I didn't know who had done what segment sure. going in. Yeah. All I knew about this is that at some point Kane Hodder plays a monster, uh -huh. so I had a pretty good guess on that. <laughs> But uh, I didn't know who was doing what segment. And then I saw what appears to be Adam Rifkin starring in this. Yeah. So I was thinking, well, this is either one of the other directors directing him or, in fact, it is, you know, Adam Rifkin's uh, bit. But then Alex, uh, the girl who plays Alex in Lost, right. which is kind of cool. I really love that actor. Right. And Ray Wise Ray from Wise. Twin Peaks. And uh, Swamp Thing. Who's just such a fucking pro, man. Yeah, he is. That the credit sequence later... The uh, the way you see him deliver all of this complicated jargon, straight face, just tongue twisters yeah. of uh, absurd script, and he just carries this kind of weight that's, that's really astonishing. And there's also the really awkward and strange Eric Roberts cameo at the end. 
where he's just barking orders into the phone and he said what does he say he says uh begin operation oh Anisha. yeah yeah it's just really weird to see eric because i view eric roberts there. especially since the expendables i view him as a pretty high listed actor sure I didn't it's weird to see him that. show up at the end and make cum jokes <laughs> right and then well, peace and it, out. that's the other thing monster sperm yeah is fucking gross is <laughs> so we haven't seen this much come since uh a dirty shame probably yeah. So can we transition by jumping from Robert England to Kane Hodder? Is that... Um, yeah, I guess so. That's a great game, but a failure <laughs> of a, an experiment. Everybody was all excited about that girl, but when she says from Robert England to Kane Hodder, unless that's a test, yeah. you should eject her from your vehicle. Yeah. At least she knows uh, what those two names are. Yeah. I do like Twizzlers instead of Red Vines. Yeah, that's She funny. orders Red Vines, he gets Twizzlers. It's, uh, man, the Twizzler, we don't need to talk about this, but the Twizzler versus Red Vine debates, if you've ever met somebody who uh, cares about such yeah. things, is apparently a hotly contested yeah, issue. Yeah, what the fuck is that about? I don't know, but people get very, very picky about these two things. It's the kind of, uh, it's like the plasma versus LCD debate. Uh-huh. It's just something people nerd out on. There's a lot of nerding out. There's a lot of references oh, like sure. that in this movie. A lot of Star Wars, strangely, yeah. for a for a gory horror film. So then we move into the second short, which is I Was a Teenage Werebear. And this is directed by Tim Sullivan. Sure, yeah. Lynn Shea is in it. Mm-hmm. She does a stellar job. What I really get on board with is the Herschel Gordon Lewis element. Yeah, of it's that true. Stuff. It is very Herschel Gordon Lewis. I mean, you get Brain Girl. Yeah. Who, uh, right, that's a total Gordon yeah. Lewis thing. It was, it's just lots of uh, lots of red, lots of bright red, and the super and cheesy pink. violence. Yeah, that kind of paper mache looking yeah. painted fake head type thing. And it's fun. Like it has some really fun moments. But it comes in the unfortunate spot where it's sandwiched between the previous mentioned one and uh, you know the Diary of Anne right. fucking Frankenstein. Yeah, that's true. This particular short, mm-hmm. the Diary of Anne Frankenstein, feels like. Someone had the guts to make a movie out of one of the Grindhouse trailers. Yeah, it really does. You know, I I talked about that with the Adam Rifkin, the aesthetic he was using, a little bit of the aesthetic he was using. But this is, I mean, this is a concept that was a two-minute trailer. Sure. That was just meant to be the most offensive thing ever, drawn into a 30-minute movie that honestly I could have dealt with being an hour and 20-minute movie. it's absolutely amazing. And it's not... In any small part due to having Joel David Hitler. When Joel David Moore is revealed to be Hitler, it was uh, it was one of the best things that happened yeah, to me all day. me too. I mean, honestly, it, first of all, Joel David Moore plays Hitler. Yeah. I, that's just Joel David Moore plays Hitler. It's amazing. But secondly, to see Joel David Moore back with Adam Green. Sure. I mean, uh, these two paths have uh, definitely forked for some time. Right. And in my mind, the best Adam Green stuff is, you know, Hatchet, is Spiral, sure. is that early Joel David Moore stuff. These guys making films together, I mean, was just incredible to watch. Yeah. And so just to, to reunite those two, no matter what the fuck they do, it's amazing. I think one of my favorite things about Diary of Anne Frankenstein, other than all of it, is that Joel David Moore doesn't speak German. Oh, yeah, you were telling me about and that. And all That's the amazing. other characters are speaking German. Fluently translated sure. German. Beautiful German. Except Joel David Moore is just winging it yeah. the whole time. He's making Mars attack sounds, basically. And he's uh, he's accusing the couscous, which means puppies, of making him forget about World War One. God, I didn't even catch that because I'm so busy reading yeah. subtitles and taking yeah. notes and, doing, and thinking about how much I love black and white for some strange yeah. reason. So that's the part that throws me back to to the real Hammer Horror stuff. Sure. That real, well, it uh, makes me think of Young Frankenstein. Yeah, that that's too. just because I went on a long spout about the 30s aesthetic. Well, that was, you know, that was great when we did that movie because it really stuck to a lot of that stuff, as did, you know, Ed Wood. That was another one we were talking about, again, a lot when we talked about Mars Attacks recently. But just heading back to that aesthetic, treating it the, the way they right. did in that modern setting. I mean, that's everything that I liked Wadzilla for. Sure. It's just bringing that aesthetic into modern day and playing with it. And I didn't think I could have this much fun after Wadzilla going back to black and white, you know, after, after that was done so well to go back to black and white and then think about Dracula and Wolfman and just all of that great stuff. 
But as with any Adam Green thing, the writing is not to be overlooked here. I mean, oh, the, no. the joke about faking the diary. Yeah, that's is amazing. Great. There's just a bunch of stupid, subtle jokes. Well, there's a lot of uh, Hitler is is chaplain degrees of silly yeah. going on here. Uh, the interrupted music number is that's phenomenal, so good. especially especially after I was a teenage werebear. Right. But then there's also those moments like the eyeballs at the end. The uh, the usual double feature likes when you reuse something but elevate it above the original. You know, here's an effect that isn't just uh, that and the arm tear, both of them. Yeah. It's not just, oh, this is kind of from back then. It's, hey, why don't we take stuff we were doing and hatch it, do an even better job, and then put it in this aesthetic. Well, and like you said, bringing Joel David Moore to Adam Green raises a very important question. Which is what? And that is, has anyone in Hollywood fought Kane Hodder? More than Joel oh, David Moore. probably not. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's great because, well, it's also great because Kane does the Jew dance. At yeah, the that end, is one is of the funniest things. Like, I can just, weirdest. if I were directing that, I would never say cut. Yeah, you know, I, um, I would never when say When we cut. saw the Jason stuff, I had this image in my head of Kane Hodder being kind of a scary guy to be around. Sure. And the more I see him do things, the funnier I sure. think he is. But yeah, you're right. I don't think anybody's ever, because nobody really comes back in the, the Jason films. Yeah. It's always Kane Hodder and then cast of other people for a couple movies. Uh, and the, Joel David Moore, this is several instances now. We'll see if we can rack up a couple more. That'd be great. All right. So we have one more uh, short and it's not defecation. No, uh, it's deceptively. Not. I was, yeah, I was scared when that happened. I know it's, it's especially because you've been going wrong turn two, wrong yeah, turn two. I know. I'm really excited. I, I to was going to gonna say something, but I figured I'd just let you figure it out because it's funny. Yeah, it always. So mortifying. the one thing that's great about Defecation is Sunny Lane is in it, and she's one of my favorite porn stars of all time. Great. Um, other than that, Defecation is just. I mean, it's just supposed to make you feel like something awful you have to sit through something you don't want to sit through or that you're missing out on something right. you don't care about yeah. <laughs> that uh there had to be a fourth movie that was going on in right. the drive-in and uh you know what bear or no bear there are more pressing matters right. to uh, attend to so joe lynch does zombie movie which yeah. actually ends up being the drive-in itself sure great and uh, because that was the four rooms question is sure. who's doing the stuff right. between and we get this uh the one iconic Joe Lynch thing, which is one badass motherfucker. Yeah. Joe Lynch, to me, it's a badass motherfucker who you just want to watch kick ass all day. Yeah. Oddly, that badass motherfucker is, for the most part, Richard really. Yeah. Go fucking figure. I mean, you know, so this is this is one that's more a throwback to the zombie stuff. Yeah. The kind of, I think, more the Romero era yeah, of for zombie sure. stuff. Except the ones where he was fucking the zombies. Well, so there's the, the electronic score, the more modern version of kind of the Carpenter mm -hmm. instruments. Uh, doesn't sound anything like a score Carpenter would compose, but you hear that, uh, you hear that electronic stuff. And it's got its, its violent, campy moments, oh, too. Yeah. It's ripping apart sex organs in front of sure. a baby and stuff that feels a little wrong. Well, and by this part in the film, it's really self-aware. You it get is, the, yeah. I guess that makes me the final girl. Sure. And which you, is a great reference. I mean, and then you get to the point where Richard really is just spouting off film lines. He is. And yeah. The in-between stuff is honestly some of my favorite stuff from any of this. I love coming. Sometimes it's a drag when you do anthologies yeah. to come back to that stuff. But I love coming back to these characters and seeing what they're doing and... Uh, I suddenly realized that not enough horror movies uh, take place at drive throughs It's true. I don't know why we're not using that more. So Richard really becomes a great action star. Apparently. I mean, he it's funny in how terrible he is because he's a theater owner who likes Orson Welles. Sure. Which, I mean, that's the type of role that Richard really plays. I'm not going to say he's an incredibly diverse actor for as much as we're talking him up. But every time he's there doing his thing, I absolutely love it. Yeah. Rosebud motherfucker. So I hope it doesn't feel like we skim through Chillerama, but uh, we got to talk super and I'm worried about it going ridiculously long. There's something I want to address immediately, if you don't mind. Yeah, and we'll please. Just kinda, I know, what it, throw it, I know what it is and I fully agree. Okay, cool. There's uh, the kick-ass thing, yeah. right? There's a movie called Kick-Ass, which is uh, kind of a hit movie as well. And also yeah. about uh, people without powers, superheroes yeah. without powers. Now, when this came out, there was a lot fighting against super for people to see it. Kind of the uh, the packaging of the movie, the marketing of the right. movie. The cast of the movie. Definitely. And we'll talk about all that stuff. But there was also the fact that a, a movie with a similar high concept premise had sure. come out uh, fairly In far recently. far wider release. Yeah, that's true too. That's definitely true too. 
And so, you know, James Gunn, the director, writer of this movie, and Mark Miller, who was the comic artist for Kick-Ass, they're kind of friends. They know each other. Sure. They were working on writing these things separately uh, at around the same time. It was a complete mm-hmm. coincidence. You know, I was reading this uh, AICN interview with James Gunn, and he was talking about how Mark Miller was just asking him, oh, hey, what are you working on? And he was describing Super, and Mark Miller was kind of like, oh, bummer, I'm sort of doing the same thing right now. And they just both went their separate directions for it. And, you know, none of that even matters because when you're talking about superhero without powers, comedy, yeah. you know, Hero at Large was something he mentioned. It's the John Ritter film from the uh-huh. 80s. That's the exact same, you know, comedy, sure. superhero without powers. It's the first of really what is many of those type of movies. Yeah. It's a subgenre sure. in and of itself. But I do want to talk about while uh, the movie didn't do incredibly well in theaters, it had this great release. It, uh, it went unrated to the theaters. And then it went, uh, once again, video on demand. Uh, I think IFC put it out. And you could get it at home. You could watch this movie at home literally less than two weeks after it was released in That's theaters. Awesome. It's, uh, it was a huge hit on the home market. And a lot of people saw it there that didn't see it you know, unrated in that smaller distribution of right. theaters. But just as uh, we love seeing people do different things with their movies, I love seeing people do different things with their releases yeah. too. I think that theater system is tired and poor and uh, has not caught up with technology. Yeah, I agree with you. There needs to be more experimentation. It's the same as the music industry, man. We yep. just got to try other things and, <laughs> and see what's profitable, see what works. So tell me about the people who are in this film that I don't think I care about, but actually right. love. The major players in Super are all people that I didn't know I cared about. Yeah. Um, it's important that we stress that because I think I feel the same way you right. do. I care about these people sure. all of a sudden. So why. what I will, I'm going to start with Kevin Bacon and here's why. I didn't know he's he, perfect he was still acting. Here. I don't think he knew he was still acting. And he pops out. He does Super. He does what? He was in Crazy Stupid Love. He was in X-Men. Oh, great. Suddenly Kevin Bacon yeah. is back. And not only is he back, but he's the best actor there is. Yeah. I want to see everything he's in. What so, the hell? I'm not going to say that I wasn't excited to see Kevin Bacon. It's just that I wasn't expecting to see Kevin Bacon. You weren't expecting to be excited to see yeah. Kevin Bacon either. And um, now suddenly you are. But the other three, the ones that I, I mean, the three of them in a film together, I can't believe I still went to the theater I think we to have see the it. the exact same three. It's Ellen Page, yeah. Liv Tyler, uh-huh. and Rain Wilson. Ah, crap. I do not care about these people minutes before I go into see Super. Yeah. And then... While Super is playing, they are the best possible cast for this film. And I'm so glad that they're in this movie. See, I feel that way about Rain Wilson and Liv Tyler. I didn't know I liked them. I saw Super and then I've seen them in things uh, subsequently and they're fucking amazing. They're great. Ellen Page, I felt really good about in Hard Candy. I've read some stuff she's written and I've heard her interviewed a couple times and she's just wicked smart and sounds great. Yeah. But then Juno happened. Juno, man. Yeah, I don't know. It it made me, not to say she was terrible in it or anything, it just made me second guess the types of films well, she might do. Fault. That's, uh, I mean, all of these actors, you, none of these people I really thought, oh man, that's a, I never looked at Rain Wilson and went, that's a bad actor. No, that's I looked true. at Rain Wilson and went, I don't know if I care about Rain Wilson movies. All I cared about with Rain Wilson was Dwight and I guess House of a Thousand Corpses. Yeah, I mean, we should have picked up on a couple of these things, you know? Kevin Bacon and Liv Tyler, I'm sure we could go back into their films. And while we'll see the... the Hollow Man. Uh, oh, my God. We'll see the glaring... Friday the 13th. There we go. Yeah. Fix that right away. The mainstream stuff, the stuff that's well known is the stuff that we kind of look at and go, I don't think those are the movies yeah. that, we, that we watch. But now we do. I love being surprised like that. That's one of the best things that can really happen to you is just to completely 180 defy your expectations on something like that. There were names that did bring me to this besides James Gunn, uh-huh. who I will James just Gunn was honestly actually at the end of James the Gunn and Rob Zombie were the two well, sole that the names other that it took to draw me to see Super. If uh, Rob Zombie gets the part of God in your movie, yeah. I think we might be on the same page. Yep. We would be in the small club of people who know what's going on in horror. Yeah. And everybody else would be people who whine about Rob Zombie. That's really all that yeah. needs to be said about that before the hate mail starts <laughs> coming in. Michael Rooker as well. Henry yeah. Portrait of a Serial Killer at all. Slither, I mean, obviously, yeah, is another big one on our show. Too. Nathan Fillion did, uh, on our show, I think it was just Dr. Horrible's sing-along blog. And Slither. Oh, yeah, that's right. Slither, too. <laughs> God. 
where he's amazing, right? right? How do I not? Oh, Serenity. Uh, We've done Serenity. Jesus fucking Christ. Okay, so what, Nathan Fillion. You Fillier picked Doctor Horrible over I just, Serenity. You know, I don't know what happened. To me. <laughs> I am a terrible human being. Can I also uh, put Andre Royo in there, who is on yeah. uh, The Wire? And um, he's in Fringe. Yeah, has a great little bit part in Fringe. Uh, amazing stuff. But James Gunn yeah. is ultimately the name. He is the uh, the American born hero. in trauma. And then yeah. like, somehow raised out of the ranks. He put out Lolly Love, which was still under trauma mm-hmm. regime. Um, I don't mean regime in a bad way. That sounds so <laughs> evil. Oh, my no, God. That's funny. I like that trauma has some kind of yeah. empire. And then uh, he Lolly did... Love was with then wife Jenna Fisher, right. who actually recommended Rain Wilson, who recommended Ellen Page, because, which is wow, kind of how this whole thing that's came together. That's a crazy together. chain of recommendation. Yeah, so you can hear about that on our, a little bit on our trauma, I call it our trauma show, but the one where we did Toxic Avenger, (laughs) and then also on Slither. Go back to Slither, we'll talk James Gunn a lot. Yeah. We have a mission, we have to talk about violence today. But you know, as we're uh, starting to get into all this heavy stuff, I want you to remember the marketing. Can you remember back to the marketing? Oh, I do. And And that was what scared the both of us. If we're going to remember back to marketing, we have to remember back to Juno. It's and true, yeah. to Napoleon Dynamite. Sure. And to The Eagle versus Shark. Rain film. Wilson and Ellen Page are in a movie that uh, I believe the credits are made by Nickelodeon yeah. or MTV it's or something. It's in a movie where it's drawings on notebook paper and OMG totes adorbs. Yeah, exactly. And, and the fucking music, right? I Which can't turns out to be that amazing. This is supposed to be irony. Yep. And I'm just going to walk in. Everybody's going to be really hip and they're going to realize some very obvious things about each other that they didn't know before. So we're back to our age old, uh, one of our show favorites of the Trojan horse, yeah, which is, uh, in our best moments, our absolute best moments, something we think we barely achieve, but it takes this capsule of great things we'll talk about and it markets them with this credit sequence and this cast of, uh, stuff thrown to an audience that sure. isn't, uh, isn't cons- the audience that signs up yeah, for Yeah, there's all construction papery. I mean, yeah, it you seems, know, you know what we're it's talking so about. It's so annoying. I hate it. You but do. Only, you despise I it. I only hate it because of what it typically signifies. Right. That's what I, I want to clarify that because it's awesome seeing Super and then going back and seeing the ad campaign and the artwork. Yeah. I love <laughs> yeah, it. Yeah, right. Well, it seems like a sick joke at this point. Yeah. Well, you and I were worried because on one hand, we have hipster nonsense we don't fucking care about. And on the other hand, we have James Gunn. Right. God damn James Gunn. But James Gunn hasn't put out too many movies, and sure. you and I are no stranger to the director selling out to make yeah, or a popular one hit wonder thing, the sure. accidental, you know, whatever. A lot of hands go into making a film. So we didn't know at this point. This could make or break. We didn't I know. I had uh, faith. I just hated yeah. the fucking artwork. Ultimately, I think we both went to it. We yep. both uh, got excited about it. We both had no idea he would go on and make lollipop chainsaw and other crazy things, you know, <laughs> after Super. It's true. And so we get funny moments. We get uh, the comedy that we were, I'm not going to say the breed of comedy we were fearing because it's just straight up dark comedy. Yeah, it is. Um, everything about this movie is fucking dark. And the things that aren't are worse than dark, really. Yeah. But uh, we get Rain Wilson as a college student, which is funny. Yeah, that is one of the funnier moments in the movie. Religion, as always, basically makes fun of itself. Yeah. But there's, uh, you know, that same interview, James Gunn was really priding himself on being the only comedy with three rape scenes in it. Yeah. That's the setup for essentially what we're getting. You know, when when she rapes Frank, which is the best rape scene. That is possibly one of the most fucked up. Yeah. awkward hot scenes in any movie you know if you uh didn't heed our warning and you're listening to this despite the fact you haven't seen super by the way it's not too late you're you're just ruining for yourself the best goddamn thing ever but uh that that last sentence really sets up what's happening in yeah. the rest of the film so that scene is awkward the sex is all, really all the sex throughout sure. the movie is awkward but the fighting's awkward too yeah right before that libby's trying out to be bolty and yeah. she's doing these awkward real person flips half cartwheels yeah exactly how you or i would probably do a sure. cartwheel where we're afraid that we're gonna hurt ourselves so yeah, our legs yeah. don't actually leave the ground and then when she puts on her costume it's just it's quiet and she's trying to be sexy but there's just these uncomfortable sounds of well and breathing. she's not 100 percent sure how to be sexy exactly and we're not yeah. sure she's trying to be sexy or if yeah. she's just a little naive or if it fits weird and yeah she doesn't really know. Uh, it's yeah. just everything about the film is a little baggy and oafish 
it's to go back to the artwork. It makes sense with the artwork. You get sure. this glue and paste Crayons. and sticking it all together and trying to make it look like something. Sure. That's how the majority of the film, it's, it's never actually what it is. It's just a semblance of what it's supposed to be. Sure. That kind of facade. You know, that's one end of the spectrum, but I think when we hit the other end of the spectrum, the best example of that is the, uh, the Crimson Bolt costume. Yeah. It's really, honestly, it's one of the best superhero costumes. It feels very real. It doesn't feel manufactured like your, um, you know, like the Batman costume, right? right. The, it the looks Nolan like something Batman May films. sewed up. Remember May? Yeah, yeah, it looks absolutely. Like something May would have sewn together. Yeah, it does with some pads on it. It's still pretty badass. Yeah, you no, know, it, it is. still looks like a superhero it's edgy uniform, and gritty. Yeah, it's also practical though. Yeah, that's so, the most important. You know, you part. you accomplish this thing that's that's practical, like you said. It's gritty. It looks homemade, but it looks uh, well enough put together that you know you buy this guy real superhero. You don't even have to go. Oh, I guess that's the best a person could do. That just becomes the costume. Right. If he had access to Bruce Wayne's tools, he would probably build the same fucking costume over again. And then they treat this superhero in the same way that, you know, we have the awkward real sexuality or the awkward real uh, people doing flips. We get the awkward real everybody knows. Yeah. He's the crimson. Everybody knows. You know, the no butts guy. Uh, who do you think you're fooling? Tells yeah. me that immediately I just when he saw comes you. back. Yeah, because it doesn't make any fucking sense, right? He just talked to him in the line about this. And then Libby calls him out. I mean, very next scene, calls him out immediately. Again, it's just realistic. He's not covering his tracks at all. Uh, Michael Rooker and gang, they all know. I mean, everybody knows. The costume's concealing his identity well. He's just not, you know, he's not. People who commit crimes do not cover their tracks well. They don't think about it. He gets a really a pretty great weapon for this costume too. <laughs> he talks a little bit about all the natural superheroes. I love, you know, in the comic shop, they're always nailing the the really great comic book stuff. The iPad's gotten me way back into comic reading and I'm I'm slowly going through Sandman right now mm-hmm. and uh I've always been a kind of a fan of the Iron Man, the Batman stuff, but they're they're hitting these obscure references like the sidekicks and the old human torch and Right. Uh, when they mentioned Captain America, the first thing right. I thought was, but he's got, he's yeah. a super soldier and she corrects herself, yeah. which is great. So he gets this weapon. That's the, the thing he selects is this wrench, a pipe wrench, just this vicious, you don't want to be hit with it wrench. And that's not the only weapon shopping they do. I mean, they literally go shopping for weapons yeah. later. It's this scene that, uh, it should be fun and it is, it is fun, but you get the feeling they don't belong there. Right. You know, you start looking around and you see the other character, the people who hunt, sure. the people in hunting vests who are going to try and bag a deer later. Right. And you think, uh, these two people playing around, they're going to get yelled at. They should not be there. <laughs> and then they start shooting pictures of Kevin Bacon's character. Right. And that's where you're thinking, wow, this is really, this is really just not sure. okay. So that leads me to uh, the real violence. Which is Frank makes movie. bombs. Uh, which is Frank makes bombs. Yeah, this is um, the type of violence that's portrayed in this movie. I think is there's a lot of stuff Super does that we're not even going to talk sure. about. Sure, we just see Super yourself, read interviews, watch uh, the fucking movie, look it up. But the violent element is this is perfect for you and I yeah. for what we want in a movie because we are complete fucking pacifists who also love violence yeah, in movies. Absolutely. I mean, we think we put together, you know, we try and span out how much violence there is on the show and do stuff that's a little lighter, older. Every single movie we do has violence in it. They just all have violence in them. Uh, Different breeds of violence, but violence nonetheless. So we watch a lot of violent stuff, but you or I, I mean, we could not harm a soul. No, I wouldn't in a million years. We're just very, maybe not even to save ourselves. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, that's what I was just, as soon as you said that, I was thinking about if I were getting beaten up, Yeah, we I would probably sure. just fetal position and cry. Right. I am right there <laughs> with you. I just can't bring, we love human beings. We cannot bring harm to other people. And so Super is a movie where each hit, each bout of violence absolutely shames you oh, as an audience. God, yeah. It rubs your nose in it and it makes you feel terrible. And, you know, I'm curious about the, the way we start this, because I think it's very well crafted the way violence is plotted throughout the movie. Right away, he's knocking a woman out of a wheelchair. Sure. Which is great, because it goes back to that comedy. 
it goes back to, oh, is this going to be funny? We're going to be, he's a bumbling, because that's that's it, right? Right. That's what everybody says. Oh, the the real people superhero drama thing. Mm -hmm. Knock somebody out of a wheelchair. It's funny. He's not so good at this. And the music makes it a little funny. It's the same way with the pedophile in the car. But while it's funny, the violence itself feels really savage. Every time somebody gets hit, when that cinder block falls. Sure, the cinder block's a big one. All of that stuff during that kind of look how Frank is cleaning up the streets montage. Yeah. You just, you flinch, you cringe, you wince, you turn your head and look out just one eye. It's an amazing reaction to see out of people. Yeah. You know, watching it with other people because everybody gets geared up for the moment we've all experienced in movies, sure. especially if you watch, this is great because we probably always, I don't know about you, but I always see this movie with people who love violent action movies, Yeah, you know? And so we're getting ready to celebrate. And even with the people who are accustomed to this, right away, you sort of question it. Yeah. Not too much at first. At first it's kind of playful and you just think maybe, maybe the action's not, it's not that it's not very good, but why, why am I not reveling in it? Like usual, something's a little off here. And I think a lot of that can be attributed to the fact that James Gunn makes it look just like real life, but he treats it like it's in a movie. So you don't really know where, you know, this is some of the, uh, the more modern Cronenberg stuff, Eastern promises or a history of violence, that type of action and, uh, real world implication, but without the real world treatment, it treats it like, here's some fun music and you get montages, you get violent montages. So everything is treated light as if it's in a movie. And that might make it feel dirtier. In fact, I would say that definitely makes it feel dirtier. Yeah. You know, there's uh there's no question by the time he's making the uh the cracks the guy, the no butts guy, right? Mm -hmm. Cracks the guy in the face and hits the woman he was with for butting in line. Destroys this man's face. You just assume from the way he goes down after that wrench that he's gonna kill him. That's Mm -hmm. it. And the, uh, the action music there isn't for ambiguity at all. It's now there definitively just to make you feel bad, to make you feel like, hey, if you're enjoying this, maybe you should reevaluate that situation. So we have Frank and his kind of misguided ideas about what's okay and what's justice. Sure. Yeah. And then we have him trying to teach that to Libby, who has even further skewed. Sure ideals about what's allowed she there's the car keying guy yeah who may or may not even be guilty sure she's sure, right. uh, she's ready to smash his face with a statue oh man she's, she's gonna kill even him. more remorseless than he is and it's just this i mean you freak out you yeah, gasp you do. and you, you hope do. to Don't god do that. that frank will stop her before the guy's face gets smushed because you know if the face gets smushed it's going to be a brutal goddamn mess yeah and you're gonna have to look at it knowing this movie you're yeah. gonna have to stare right you have to stare at it you, you just want you want god's tentacles to come yeah the weird wrap the weird around looks her really arms. good but looks really slither tentacles yeah you're not sure what's I guess going on I, there. we should refer to god as rob zombie in this film i guess well, i love those tentacles too because it's obviously uh not god but a delusion of his uh hentai dream <laughs> that he's sure. having yeah he stops her and they cut back to the blood pouring out of this man's face and just the screams of of anguish how quick she is to to execute this guy and then to find out it it isn't even the guy i mean right. then you're mortified but you know you mentioned frank's misguided sense of all this stuff that dynamic between the two of them is incredible especially in those those early rounds of that stuff because it exposes how wrong Frank is sure. by basically giving him a sidekick who's even more wrong, you know, than he is and thinking, how is he going to, you know, groom her to, she doesn't know that killing's not what they signed up for. Sure. I mean, she's in it. When you think Frank is like, maybe she'll pull Frank back a little bit. She's even worse. She's fucking off the deep end. Right. You know, she hits the attacker with a car. Uh, they shoot the, the other guy when, uh, you know, they're chasing the two of them down And this is, I mean, to, again, look at the progress of violence in this movie. This is where it starts to become a little justified, at least in cinema. I mean, they're being hunted down. They have to get rid of their assailants. So they hit them with a car and they shoot them. And, uh, you know, these two men that are chasing them were going to kill them. But somehow I still feel bad. You know, I still feel awful. Uh, Libby gets out of the car. She makes it, again, as always, Libby makes it even worse. Uh, She just laughs hard and forced and awkward. And she starts screaming at them in this vulgar way as they're there dying, yeah. you know, in the street. 
And the camera stays with the man dying on the hood, you know, cuts back to him as if, oh, don't forget, there's there's one going over here. So, you know, we just keep going back to that. We just keep reminding the audience of that. The film does this really bizarre and wonderful thing with the comic aspect. Mm -hmm. And it starts when Frank is making bombs. <sighs> when just Frank says the word in. bombs, yeah. they do the etchy kind of comic-esque bomb text. Yeah. And then when that graduates into the following scenes with this horrific slaughter yeah they juxtapose it with ha, ha, it's a comic yeah <laughs> yeah really they've never rubbed your face in it more yeah than that. that's the you know that's the worst it's come he's making bombs at home and you're begging him to stop yeah it's bad enough when he makes the little weapon and you're like ah, oh, these guys are dangerous i don't know if you guys should be making oh my god you're making bombs please stop making he's psychotic you know at this point that he is psychotic and no one is going to stop him yeah he's the law in this movie you have no hope. So the bombs start going off, and you're right. They're, it's barbaric. I mean, they are slaughtering people. But I think one of the worst bits of violence in the whole thing, which translates in a movie, especially like this, to one of the greatest bits of violence, yeah. is when Libby gets shot, and you're thinking, oh, is, is she going to, at the very worst, be dead? They're wearing the Kevlar vest. Yeah, at the very worst, yeah. be dead. The f and thank you, yes. That's going to be the little thing where the film, oh, she's got a bullet in her face, and she's wah, wah. and he rolls her over. They artfully cover it as uh, she's being rolled over. And when you see her face, not only is her face broken, she is way beyond dead. There's no final words, yeah. no monologue, no time for the movie to get a little sweet. It's just, oh, hey, sometimes... People die and that's it. And they're gone. That thing that was important to you, all that awkward sex stuff you were hoping got resolved, any kind of development between sure. these two, doesn't matter. She is way dead. And her head is smoking. Well, and that's the other thing, right? I mean, the smoke coming from her broken face, I have never seen realistic yeah. gore of that caliber, that, that kind of effect. I mean, it, when James Gunn's doing this, when he's writing this, when he's there directing this, this is a scene that is obviously pivotal as well as really historic. People will remember sure. back to, you know, this will be on top 10 lists, right? Or should in any rights be. And so we need this to really mean something. This is a key moment for this theme about violence we're trying to drive home. And they bring it. Yeah. They bring it in a way better than I've ever seen uh, in the way that it, it needs to be brought. When you're doing something like this in your movie, it's enough to do it. But if you can do it better than it's ever been done before, yeah. then you really have something amazing. And there. they totally do. But that's not the end of it either. No. That could be a, a, a climactic point, And then we just kind of go out on that. That could be a realization. There's a bunch of vicious shooting, not the least of which is the one that it's difficult not to laugh with horror at. Yeah. Where the uh, amputeed, oh, yeah, exploded I was thinking the same man thing. says, I want to live. Yeah, I don't want to die. And he it's... gets met with shotgun blast after shotgun oh, blast he just looks at him i mean it's severe in how unfeeling it is i think it's the same for michael rooker's character's oh death God. immediately following that by the end of that he's not even a man it's he's disgusting just a, a body of it takes that that same thing about pummeling uh wet chunks of bone in the floorboard yeah. from sin city yeah that there i really liked and enjoyed and could turn around and watch right now and really enjoy but given the context, given what this uh, story's doing, and given that you know you're being shamed, when you see his corpse, you just think that man just drained the life out. Yeah. He turned that human being into a Putty. corpse. And then it all culminates in this scene between Frank and Jacques. Mm -hmm. Jacques asks, do you think stabbing me to death is going to solve all the world's problems? And uh, Frank goes off in this diatribe about how the rules were set a long time ago. Sure. And I can't know unless I try yeah. and he starts stabbing him. And it's this weird moment where you realize that Frank is in the comic book world and he's just, he's gone. Well, they're both lunatic. They're sure. both criminals and lunatics. Yeah, exactly. In this conversation, neither is necessarily wrong. They're right. Just exactly. Talking about, yeah. you know, the, uh, the ends that they have reached are, not something that people should do. Yeah. I mean, he's right. You shouldn't molest children and you yeah. shouldn't cut in line I mean, or those whatever. Those are the rules. And I mean, everything they say, I agree with. And I think it's beautifully stated and wonderfully put. It's just bizarre that it's 
proceeded by stabbing someone to death. Sure, that you're simultaneously agreeing and disagreeing yeah. at incredibly hard at you, these I just polar agree a hundred percent to what they're saying and a disagree a hundred percent to what's being done. Man, I can't remember the last time we talked so long about just one tiny component of uh I mean, this is one of the bigger themes of the sure. movie. We we don't want to sell this short at all. It's definitely what the movie's driving home, but there's a lot of other stuff to it. And I think based on the violence alone and the treatment of that, this is without a doubt one of my favorite movies of all time. It transcends being a good or a great movie. It becomes a an important movie. That sort of primal, heartless treatment of the violence alone gives it those credentials. And this is all, I mean, you have to remember, this is in a simplistic genre that definitely gets way more credit than it's due. Sure. Comic book movies. Some of the most fiscally successful movies, some of the highest rated movies. And by comparison, Super makes nearly everything else in the genre seem lazy and repetitive. Yeah. And that's coming from, you know, this was a conversation we started by addressing allegations that Super itself was a copycat. Right. Super was the copycat. After watching the film, I believe that it's it's not only impossible, but even ironic to make yeah, a claim like true. that. All right, so there's this website. Uh -huh. It's doublefeatureshow.com. You know, I've been there. You can uh, find some of James Gunn's other stuff on there, as well as all the directors we talked about sure. in Chillerama. Um, well, just tell me right away, doublefeatureshow at gmail.com. What are we doing next time? Uh, next time we're going to do, we're doing something with dolls. Uh, Welcome to the Dollhouse and Beyond the Valley of the Dolls. Cult films less violent have dolls in them. A little bit of Russ Meyer. That's definitely it. Watch more fucking film. Bye.